Simon, how big was that week? How much work would have gone in behind the scenes to, to pull that off? Because we, we talk about the one-on-one with President Biden and so on, but many talks held in Washington on Capitol Hill, other foreign leaders as well. What did you make of it? Uh, well, it was pretty amazing, Kieran. It was probably the biggest week for Australia in Washington in a long, long time. I, I'm struggling to think of a time where the announcements, the fora that the Australian Prime Minister is, is represented at, and behind the scenes, Kieran, you're absolutely right, the Prime Minister between, I think it was the front of the week in New York and the back of the week in DC, there are a couple of days there in Washington. Uh, he hosted Boris Johnson up at White Oaks, the Australian ambassador's residence, and had two very full days of engagement up on Capitol Hill on both sides of the aisle before the Quad meeting. Now, why? Um, because we've got to get this 12 to 18 month consultation mm-hmm. period on bringing that capability under August to Australia. The signals that sends at the very top of the Australian political leadership is invested, very key signals to send to the US Congress who have a voice in some of these tech transfer issues that are going to be on the docket. So shoring up bipartisan support for that really key part of the agenda uh, as well. Simon, what do you say to concerns that... So I've seen analysts refer to AUKUS with a, with a little question mark. What happens if the United States goes back to an America first sort of mentality, that isolationist mentality. Is that a risk for for this sort of investment, both in dollar terms and and in alliance terms? Yeah, yeah. Look, I saw that too, Kieran, I, and I understand the point. Uh, just a couple of things to add to that. Um, one thing we've been tracking at the US Study Centre is there's just a lot of bipartisanship around, at a high level at least, on, on the question about the rise of China and, and what that poses to the United States and to perhaps to, to uh, Western democracies, if you will, more broadly. I think that survives, that mindset. And I think the commitment to let that technology go offshore to Australia survives as well. I don't know that America first was actually isolationist. I think it meant literally what it said, America first. Um, what's different uh, about about um, Biden, if you will, as opposed to Trump era foreign policy. It said America with allies, uh, whereas I think under the United States, it was a, sm- a mistake to refer to Trump as isolationist, nativist mm-hmm. or, or sort of nationalist, if you will. Uh, but, but I don't think isolationist quite captures it. There's a determination to stand up to China. I think this is a difference about means, not ends, but I think the, the desired sort of strategic goal not as well formed as we'd always like. I think that survives, though, in any transition, say, back to a Trump or a Trump-like uh, Republican presidency, say, 24 or 28 or, or whenever. So to, to get your thoughts as well on this other thing that the Prime Minister's grappling with now, he's in quarantine at the Lodge, but he's got to navigate, I, I guess, meeting international expectations, including that of President Biden, and John Kerry and, and the rest of that administration on climate, yet bringing his coalition with him. Um, that's that's a challenge because obviously those expectations oh. are there, aren't they, from not just the US but the, the UK as well and, and others. Yeah, and I think it probably underscores why the week, the FaceTime, getting, remember we had uh, Maurice Payne and Peter Dutton, I think they logged about a week in the US as well. Uh, you had the PM. I think yeah. that full court press on the security side of the relationship, I think part of the agenda there, I think, was perhaps to also buy us a bit of capital um, to buffer where Australia may land at the end of the day on, on climate. It, it's a true test. It's, it's why being prime minister of Australia is a, a difficult <laughs> job um, <clears throat> to pivot right from that week in DC now to, I think, a, a very sort of different political management challenge that he's got, where you've got the clock winding down on Glasgow. What is Australia going to put on the table there? And how do you, with the United States, all that reassurance and all that depth of relationship around the security relationship and where we're going there, while at the same time having to preserve some autonomy and perhaps even some policy daylight on climate 
and then keeping everything under control back in the coalition back here in Australia. I think this is one of the really fascinating phases of the Morrison prime ministership. And, and from where we sit at you as a, stud, a study centre, precise because it's got all these multiple touch points in different policy yeah. domains with the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And then you've got this uh, other balancing act of shifting style from Trump to Biden and, well, look at look at the Republican Party at the moment. I mean, who is the presumptive nominee for 2024? Who is the de facto head of the Republican Party right now? It probably, you'd say, it is Trump still. Yeah, it is. It is, Kieran. And, and this is the delicate act that is Australian diplomacy at the moment. Yes, there are challenges in the region, but, but you know, no one is going to pretend that the change in the United States between, say, Trump, Biden and what may come after Biden, right, I think everybody has to be realistic about that, What mm. the challenges that poses for Australian national interests still being furthered through the alliance, right, and, and the way that is done requires great tact, great art and great insight on, on the part of Australian policymakers, um, keeping the the good and 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 dragging out of the alliance channel things that can advance Australia's national interests, and that is U.S. presence in the region, while while trying to distance ourselves from some of the volubility we saw under Biden. And of course, you've got the institutional complexities too. You've got the White House, you've got Congress. Um, it is it is a big job servicing those relationships. Uh, our diplomatic team, uh, hockey, now Arthur Sinodinus, but that diplomatic team that supports them with the big top of the tree visits, as we've seen the last week, so, so important in a United States that is itself prone to these changes uh, between administrations and the way that policy comes out of those those different administrations. It is it is a very uh, divided country as well. So that mm -hmm. that's part of that mix that you referred to. But let's look at some developments recently, like the Arizona audit of votes. Sure. It actually found that Biden won yeah. by a larger margin than than originally thought. But that's not going to concern Trump's followers. No, that's right. It's water off a duck's back. Here and that's the other amazing thing about about Trump and his continuing hold on the Republican Party. Look, typically, when you're an incumbent president, right, and you lose the election that you're seeking uh, to contest, um, convention is that you sail off into the sunset. It's time for the party to be under new management, as it were. Very, very few. Um, American, defeated American presidents come back yeah. for another bite at the cherry, so to speak. This is what makes the Trump phenomenon just so unusual and so compelling, mm. uh, historically, politically, and substantively, every way you like, because he is the titular head, um, the de facto head, or oh, pardon me, of the, of, the, uh, of the Republican Party. He is the presumptive yeah. nominee. All evidence to the is contrary. Is there anyone else? Because <laughs> no, obviously, no, as in, well, the, the question I put to you is, he's human and he's in his mid-70s. And so the right. point is, it, it, we're still a couple of years away from the next election. So who knows what happens? I, I, you, see, you see the point I'm making. I mean, yeah, I he do. represents I do. a big part of the Republican Party. But so there are, there are some risks to all of that. Yeah. And, and I think what you're seeing, Kieran, is among... The, the, there's Trump and everybody else, and among the everybody else, there's this competition for who is best positioned to claim the Trump mantle in the event that, one, Trump doesn't run because yeah. he can't, say, for some of the reasons you're alluding to, or B, he decides not to. And so is it Abbott, yeah. the governor of Texas? Is it uh, the governor of Florida? Uh, is, it, is it some of the Republican senators? Is Ted Cruz... Uh, is, is, is clearly positioning himself okay. that way. Some uh, positioning indeed happening. Simon Jackman, great to get your insights as always. Appreciate it. Good on you, Kieran. Thanks a lot.